Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing part 122 of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights. We take a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making and use them to talk about some of the wonderful biodiversity that we share our world with. So today we've got a couple animals coming back. I was going to put this video out a little earlier but I played Far Cry 3 again. I love that game so I thought I would uh, play that for a bit and then release this on the eve of the... Uh, DLC coming out because obviously I'm going to cover that as soon as I can because how can you not love uh, the Oceania pack when you live in Oceania? But um, yeah, a uh, few remasters but a cool few really cool new animals that we've got as well. So we're going to be starting off today with Narwhaler doing a, some remasters of some of uh, his mods. We have got here the Eastern Black and White Colobus, also known as the Mantor de Gunzura, I believe you say that, it's a type of Colobus monkey. So these guys are a type of old world monkey that live throughout much of West and East, uh, West Central and Eastern Africa, living in countries like Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea, uh, in Nigeria, Ethiopia, in Kenya, and Chad as well. And there are several different subspecies that develop an appearance, but it's kind of appearance, it's not really genetics based, I believe. But what really gives their name is with that kind of mantle, is it looks like they've got this like long strands of these long white hairs going down their back. And that's what's been updated to look a lot more hair-like. So really, really awesome uh, animal there. And you can see its face also has this like big uh, tuff on it as well. It looks really, really cool. So in terms of its, as I mentioned, there's a bunch of different subspecies that live across like all the different areas and a lot of them are different by morphology i'm not sure there's been much research into the genetics of how they actually differ from each other and it's really hard because there's like a lot of intermittent characteristics and then some uh subspecies have females bigger than others ones it's really kind of a little bit confusing with the colobus but still really really cool in that regard so you can see you've got that distinct pelt a uh, really really cool infants are typically born with pink skin and white hair that darkens from age three to four and the males usually gain their colorations before the females the males will typically weigh between 9.3 uh, 9 to 13.5 kilograms or about 21 to 30 pounds the females weigh about seven to nine kilograms or seven to 20 pounds so there's quite a sexual dimorphism uh, but it's uh there is some some uh, have larger teeth than females uh, males have larger teeth than females in some subspecies, some others are reversed, so the females have larger ones. And it's kind of really interesting in that regard. And some there's not even even difference, so that's part of the real thing. It's kind of confusing. But uh, females will get about uh, 7.8 to 9 per 2 kilograms, or 70 to 20 pounds. Average head to body length for a male colobus monkey is about, or a male, um, not colobus. I'm thinking this is the uh, eastern black and white colobus. Uh, is that, so yeah, the colobus monkeys. So these guys get about 61 centimeters or about 24 inches long for males, head to body, and about 57 or 22 inches for females. And they have small uh, thumbs, but they're actually vestigial like many other colobus monkeys, which is quite interesting. So I already mentioned the habitat. They like to live in rainforests and those kind of very forested places like mountain forests and things like that, savannah woodlands, even big found in riparian areas and things like that, found at high elevations, but pretty much anything as well. This will be sometimes found in swamps and actually human-made like areas. So like eucalyptus plant stations in Africa, uh, they will um, like live in there, which is quite interesting. But in terms of its ecology, these guys are primarily arboreal. So they do spend uh, most of the time in the trees, but they will come down to forests sometimes and travel. And they do and also they're pretty much up for half the day. And typically foraging and traveling is the next common activity. So they typically will forage or travel, move around. And during the day, they'll have long rest periods between moving and feeding. And that includes like grooming and breeding and playing and even performing and things like that. So very uh, stacked today for a colobus monkey, uh, for a black and white colobus. And despite these guys having a reputation as a leaf eater, these guys are not an obligate foldable. So they do mainly eat leaves and fruit, fruits. But their actually diet's quite variable. They'll eat bark and flowers and uh, aquatic plants and uh, even concrete for buildings. They'll also feed on like arthropods and things like that, which is quite interesting. So nutrition like that can influence a lot of their food choices. And they even make actually travel long distances to find plants with higher nutrition as well. That's quite cool. And like all color boy monkeys, um, these guys are able to digest leaves in their large multi-chambered stomachs and able to eat a lot of fiber. They prefer food with lots of fiber because they have a specialized stomach. And uh, when there's fleshy fruits available, they prefer to eat them unripe. It was that serves as a reduced competition with the primates that eat the ripe fruits. So it's another way that they kind of avoid dealing with each other too much, you know, uh, not too much competition. 
And um, they get preyed upon by animals such as the crowned hawk eagle and uh, birds of prey. And even the chimpanzees and leopards have been known to prey on them, which is very interesting. So in terms of their social groups, these guys live in stable social groups from 3 to 15. These groups usually consist of one male and several females of juvenile, with there's some difference between the genera- uh, um, populations. And in multi-male groups, males will be aggressive to each other and one becomes dominant. Uh, multi-groups may contain father-son pairs, unrelated males, and uh, typically it's the males that kind of go out and find their group, and then the females uh, keep the groups cohesive and things like that. And because of the low-quality diet, these guys have a resident egalitarian social structure, so they often live in a group with an egalitarian dominant style, so they don't have rankings like a lot of other monkeys do. They kind of just do their own thing. But um, yeah, really, really cool in that regard. And they have a home range that they will defend or uh, core areas in their home range, but they often will share them. And females uh, will likely hang back while the males do most of the defending. And usually when it's aggressive, these guys will have chases and uh, displays and vocalizations rather than physically hurting each other. And they love a look at the cute little baby while we talk about them. So these guys are polygamous heron-based systems, so mating... uh, Typically, both males and females. So it's just that maybe the male will walk up to the partner and give like tongue smack, uh, tough smacks and mouth clicks as well. So that's quite interesting. And um, in multi uh, male groups, more than one male may mate with females. So it can be competition. But typically, if there's only one male in there, he'll mate with all the females. Typically, gestation period lasts for about 158 days with a 16 to 22 month debut theory period. And the baby will rely on its mother's support and must cling to her. But as they grow older, they can move on their own, but they will always return to their mothers. The infants uh, take up the most attention of the group. And off other females of the group can actually handle the infant, even though they're only really comfortable with their, with their mothers. So, And the males do not really pay too much attention to infants until they're about four to five weeks old. And they can eat solid food about eight, eight to nine weeks old, but 50 weeks uh, old, they are fully weaned and no longer need to hang hold on to their mother. And they're quite famous for all sorts of different vocalizations. So they've been known to roar, mainly during at night or dawn by males. But they'll make all sorts of different sounds. They'll roar to each other to maintain their territory and be like, hey, who are you? Da, da, da. And it's kind of a way to um, um, alert each other and make sure no everyone's aware of their territories and things like that. They'll also purr, which is made by before group movements. So female infants will call when they're distressed. And there's lots of tongue clicking and things like that. So it's a very interesting social structure for these uh uh, colobus monkeys, uh, the mantled colobus. I like that kind of name, but um, sadly these guys are con- well, they are considered least concern, which is lucky. But they are kind of precipice of like that. They're less threatened than a lot of other species. The mantled grenizera was actually less threatened than a lot of other species. It's still least concerned, but they are some subspecies or some populations are considered like under decline, and um, that's because of. A forest, uh, habitat degradation, and bush meat is another big thing for these guys. Uh, collapse as well. They're also threatened with the meat trade, so that's something that can be uh, quite scary for these guys. So, luckily, they're not endangered yet, but there are some populations that could be. Uh, they're started efficient, some are considered endangered. So, overall, they're doing okay, but it might not be for long. But yeah, really, really cool animals. Nice to see that guy get a remaster. So, another great mod by Narwhala. Did a really awesome job. So, Next up, we got another one by Noella. We're going to a extinct, couple extinct animals now. So we've got here the blue buck. So also done by Noella. So also called the blue antelope. These guys were an ex- uh, extinct species of antelope. And they only went extinct quite recently, only about 1800. And it's quite a bit smaller than the other two species of uh, antelopes in their genus, the hippotragus, and include the roan and the sable antelopes. They're often actually considered the subspecies of the roan antelope until like, a genetic study confirmed they were distinct. So um, they were first kind of found in the Cape of Good Hope. So they lived around Southern Africa. So that's where kind of where they're known from, like the tip of Africa. And when they were first described, uh, as I mentioned, they were described as being this really weird color. And then other people came to describe them uh, and kind of thought they were the same as the Roan Antelope, but turned that to a different thing. So in terms of evolution, based on like their studies and stuff, we know that they are kind of a little bit different. So they believe to have split off from the other antelopes, so Hippotragus, the other Ronin antelope. They're quite basal to the group, but they would have split off between uh, about the blue buck and the sable antelope kind of diverged about 2.8 million years ago, while the Ronin antelope diverged from both of them around 4 million years ago. So this is a group that kind of became a thing in the Pliocene. 
so and early Pleistocene, so it's quite interesting there. And often because if you look at uh, the quagga as another example, there seems to be a little bit of a habitat difference between that literal southern part of Africa. So the mo it's very likely that they could have had another species, a little bit more uh, cooler, more Mediterranean, so things like that. So in terms of their description, uh, these guys, the adult male that is found in uh, Lisha, there's only like one real well-preserved specimen known. I believe, is about 119 or about 47 inches tall at the withers. And it's the largest known specimen. And the tallest specimen is one in Paris that stands about 110 centimeters or 45 inches at the shoulder. But there's some that kind of get around, like there's a 100 centimeter or 40 inch tall female. And they're noticeably smaller than Ronan sable antelopes and quite a bit smaller than uh, the other members of the genus. In terms of their coat, you can see they're kind of a uniform bluish gray with a pale whitish belly and some dark like uh, lines around their face that's like brownish and things like that which is quite interesting the neck mane actually is directed forward and not develops and uh, not as developed as roan and sable antelopes and the throat mane is also kind of absent in these guys they also have like a little bit blunt ears uh, darker tufts things like that and though these a lot of these are based on old skin so we don't exactly know what the original color may have been but um, some think it looked like quite a fine blue or a bluish gray with a mixture of white as well. And he also described the ears of being pointed at over 23 centimeters or 9 inches long. And a tail about 18 centimeters or about 7 inches. And a long tuft. And they also have quite a bit shorter horns than the other types of uh, roan antelope, things like that. But uh, perhaps they are proportionally longer. So these horns of these guys are about 56 centimeters or 22 inches along the curve. And gave one horn length of about 20 inches as well. Um... It's kind of around there. But yeah, really, really cool animal. So in terms of behavior, this guy kind of really extinct about 1800. So we don't know too much about what it uh, was behavior was like. But it could be like similar to uh, modern uh, sable and roan antelopes. So according to historical accounts, they formed groups of up to 20 individuals. And similar to that, they would have been quite selective grazers. So they fed mainly on grasses, but they were quite selective about it. And they liked dicots and things like that. And they may have actually shown that blue bucks may have survived the summers of the western margin of the Cape uh, for this region because these grass were, uh, when these grasses were either palatable nor nutritious. So they had a little bit of migration where they were eastern, moved to the western parts, kind of, in, so they moved around a little bit. So yeah, really, really cool in that regard. We'll have a look at the male because we like to talk about the big impressive males there. But yeah, really, really cool. So they would have done a little bit of migrating as they were kind of living down in there because uh, some areas were not didn't have quite as nutritious plants, especially around like the Cape of Good Hope. Another thing as well is that females may have actually left their newborn calves in isolation uh, and uh, regularly returned to them to let them suckle until they joined the adult herds, which is quite similar to other antelopes like the Ronin Sable as well. And they would have carved mainly when there was rainfall, and thus the availability of grasses peaked. And such locations would have been the western margin of the Cape uh, uh, fl uh, Flora region and places like that. And there's like uh, things of fossils of juvenile blue bucks as well from west east, including these birth mostly took place in the west, and many due to higher rainfall, which is quite interesting. We can learn so much just about fossils. So in terms of its distribution, uh, these guys were endemic to South Africa. They were found on the southwestern Cape. And they didn't have that big of a range. They were typically mainly along the southern coast of South Africa. Though, however, in terms of their fossil uh, range, they can range up pretty much into like Leslo and like most of southern uh, South Africa. So it shows that maybe this is kind of a relict range from the because of the ice age. So they used to live a lot uh, more during the like glacial, glacial period. So about like uh, twenty thousand years ago they would have lived all across southern Africa. So it's a little bit of an isolated population there, which is really, really interesting. And um that could have been why that contributed to why they went extinct, uh, because they were in a relict population. Uh, there's not much habitat for them to escape to with all the people hunting them, and but we'll get into that. So we're gonna talk about their extinction now. So due to that small range, basically when everyone came in there, uh, they were believed a bluebuck was a sole species of Petragus in the region and for until 7,000, 35,000 years ago. So then the roan antelope uh, came more common at the end of the ice age as the uh, uh, ice caps receded, you know, the habitat and world got a little bit warmer. Uh, the habitat changed, so the roan antelope was able to come down to pretty much the southern parts of Africa and outcompeted the bluebuck uh, as well. So that could have contributed to their extinction a bit, but also that kind of, as I mentioned, things like uh, uh, sea level change and habitat things but the final coup de gras you could say was 
pretty much people. So people pretty much came in. They were already rare and people started hunting them, along with the quagga. They went extinct about 1883, so quite early in that time. The last kind of blue buck was kind of seen around that time, like incredibly rare during 1799-1800, and was the first historically large African mammal to go extinct. After, and then it was followed by the quagga, which is really sad. But yeah, really, really cool animal. How can you not love these guys? Uh, you know, de-extinction, everyone loves the de extinction story about the blue bucks and all that. But yeah, the ecology is uh, very similar to roan and sable antelopes from both the historical accounts and looking at the kind of general uh, anatomy and uh, accounts and behavior and genetics and things like that. But sadly went extinct, probably because a combination of the factors, the end of the Ice Age, you know, the restricted range that they used to live across South Africa, they're restricted to the uh, southern parts as the roan antelope kind of came in and took over a lot of their ranges their habitat kind of changed due to, due to the ice age ending and then humans delivered the last blow it's kind of what everyone kind of agrees over the extinction of the blue bunk at the moment but yeah really really cool animal definitely a big fan so next up we've got the quagga so another one that everyone uh knows and loves They're kind of a two package deal i say with these guys so this is the quagga so the quagga is a subspecies uh, of plain zebra, which is already in the game, that was endemic to Southern Africa until it was hunted to extinction. Uh, there has been lots of taxonomic changes with these guys. They're originally thought to be a different species of zebra. Then they were thought to be a subspecies of zebra, so just an isolated population. And now they're actually not even considered a subspecies, they're considered a cline. So what a cline is, is kind of a variation uh over like a latitude or longitude or like a range so you have this being the most southern populations of uh plain zebra these guys kind of lived in the coolest areas so they would have got uh this kind of uh to help keep them cool and then if you look at more northern populations of plain zebras uh they have a lot stronger patterning in terms of their um their stripes because of uh bugs apparently that's kind of the reason this kind of patterns that they have uh really discourages bugs and like bow fl bot flies and things like that kind of coming on laying their maggots into them so it's really really interesting in that regard so as i mentioned their taxonomy they were originally called uh called echos quagga and they were actually in the same genus uh subgenus hippo train uh, hippo tigris with uh typical zebras then they were kind of lumped into uh the plain zebra was a so equus quagga and then studies show that's pretty much made just as a cline so it's like a uh, just the southern variant or southern like morph of the uh, plain zebra so it's really changed a lot but the fossil record is quite interesting on this guy because it put zebra they were the first extinct animal to have their dna analyzed and they seem to share a common ancestor with the quagga mountain zebra about three to four million years ago and they found to be closest relative to um the plain zebra and in terms of the genetics there's very little genetic diversity and they seem to have split from other plain zebra subspecies between 120,000 to 290,000 years ago during the Pleistocene but possibly during the penultimate glacial maximum so kind of got isolated in Africa when it was at its coldest and that's when they kind of split off and did their own thing which is quite interesting. A 2018 genetic study showed that they were um, plain zebra should convert that quagga was a member of that species and they found the evidence for subspecific differences uh, so they most likely must have been a local wharf or just a cline as we mentioned which is quite interesting and zebras from namibia tend to be the ones closest related which makes sense namibia is quite close to africa i mean south africa so quite cool but in terms of their description these guys would have been about 257 centimeters or about eight feet five inches long and about 125 to 135 or four foot one to four foot five inches tall at the shoulder and based on those measurements, males are slightly longer and slightly taller than stallions, uh, kind of things like that. The coat pattern was quite unique. As you can see, it's got that kind of like half zebra look. So it's got the stripes of the zebra, but you can see around the back and the face there, it's got almost like a typical wild ass kind of color to it, which is really interesting. It's got that reddish brown on the flanks and things like that, which looks really, really cool. And it seems to have a high degree of polymorphism, where some actually have no stripes and others have patterns very similar to normal bush shell zebras. So it's most likely just the local morph for different colors. And you can see there's all sorts of different variations within that, which is really, really interesting, especially with these guys. And the only quagga to have been photographed was one that was a mare that lived in the uh, London Zoo. 
uh, which is quite interesting. She was uh, five pictures were taken. It was six, taken from 1863 to 1870, and based on the descriptions, we kind of light dark background. But actually, a lot of them showed this could have been optical illusion, and there was a lot of variation within quagga coats throughout history from people have recorded, which is quite interesting in that regard. And very living at the very southern part of uh, Africa. Uh, and as I mentioned that range they had a thick winter coat that they actually had molted each year which is quite interesting and like other plain zebras they didn't have a dewlap like a mountain zebra and the uh the skeletal structures of Burchell zebras and quaggas quite overlapped so they think almost a problem to distinguish but they are still genetically considered pretty much this as I mentioned the plain zebra it's like a southern population of the plain zebra not even a subspecies in terms of ecology, these guys were the most southern, as I mentioned, living around like the Northern Cape, Eastern Cape, Western Cape, and like the Karoo region of uh, South Africa, and may have lived with Birchell zebras in some areas, but most likely the most southern areas, they would have been the most kind of isolated. And the function, as I mentioned, of the zebra stripes have been kind of uh, debated for a while, but these guys, most likely the biting fly hypothesis, these guys would have lived in areas with the least amount of fly activity than other zebras. So, um, because of that, cooler temperatures, less bugs, so they could have, like, afforded to not have quite as much patterning, didn't really need it. It also suggested things like sexual dimorphism, or during the ice ages, uh, the cold and isolation would have affected these guys and could have, like, led to a different mutation rate, led to some genetic drift, and given us kind of a unique morph uh, of uh, zebras as they were isolated from the more northern populations of plain zebra, which is quite interesting. But in terms of their relationship to humans, people have been painting them in cave art. So like early Dutch settlers in the Afrikaans hunted them for meat. They also used them for guards of their livestock and they attacked intruders like that. And they even brought to zoos like the London Zoo. As I mentioned, they were brought to the London Zoo and things like that. And one specimen actually lived in uh, captivity for 21 years and four months. Uh, and they actually were considered more docile than Burchell zebras, which is quite, uh, really interesting as well. And they were also thought suitable for domestication and people did use them kind of uh, a little bit because they were the most docile of most of the uh, zebras. And there were attempts to domesticate them and produce hybrids and things like that, but it kind of, as I mentioned, never really came to fruition. And there's about 23 species, uh, specimens and mountain quarkers around the world, including the juveniles, a fetus and two foals, which is quite interesting. So that's really, really awesome in that regard. And in terms of extinction, uh, they disappeared for the same reasons pretty much how um, the blue buck went extinct. People hunted them and uh, people brought them to zoos and things like that. They were most likely isolated because of the Ice Age, you know, as I mentioned, Ice Age kind of restricted that range. And as it ended, a lot of animals that would have lived more northerly, like the blue buck and the quagga, got isolated down into southern Africa due to the change in habitat. And then while... They were in that really restricted range. Humans came in and delivered the final blow. But yeah, there's actually efforts to try to breed back the quagga. Because I mentioned the quagga is not really a species in itself. It's a low, it's a morph, you could say. It's uh, And people are trying to breed back quaggas by giving them more like quagga-like traits. So giving more more brownish quaggas, kind of giving that as well. And they're trying to introduce them into their range as well. So they're called Rau quaggas. And there is, the founding population is about 19 individuals that come from Namibia and South Africa, and they've been released in different areas. And they've been trying to reintroduce things like in part of other kind of conservation projects, which is quite interesting. So it's considered something selective breeding called breeding back. So they're not going to be true quaggas, but um, they're going to create something that looks a lot like quaggas through uh, kind of uh, artificial selection. And it's been controversial because it's only going to resemble a quagga just because how we choose to think of a quagga looks like. But some people have been talking about de-extincting them, you know, using cloning, things like that. And I think that'd be a great species because we have a great idea of horse morphology and things like that and uh, reproductive biology and things like that. So I think it would be cool to there's be a good example species to bring back. Plus it's quite charismatic as well. So yeah, really, really cool. Uh, we're going to have a look at the foals because I you know, love these little foals. Look at this little cutie. Really, really awesome. So cute little guy. Next up. Okay. So next up, we have got some new animals here. This is by Le uh, Leaf and Jen and Mark. We've got the Berea. So this is a type of little antelope. So let's uh, have a look at these guys. Look at this little cutie. So the Berea antelope, uh, Dolotragus uh, metalonus, is a small arid antelope that lives in the arid parts of the Horn of Africa. It's the only member of its genus. So you can see it has quite a bushy tail and like this brownish coat or like coarse coat with this like a reddish part on the back, which is separated by um, 
kind of this really uh, bluish gray on the top and this lightish on the bottom was really is really interesting as well. It has long fawn colored legs and has black eyelids and like this white bit around it with these short horns as well. So they have large ears which are about 15 centimeters long and about 7.5 centimeters across. Uh, only the males will have horns, so they get between five, 7.5 to 10 centimeters long, and they stand straight up like that. In terms of size, the length of the animal is about 80 to 86 centimeters long, and they stand about 50 to 60 centimeters tall. So basically, three feet, uh, just under three feet long and two feet tall. And uh, typically, the they weigh between nine and 11 kilograms. So that's quite interesting in that regard. We'll have a look at the female. You can see the male has the horns, the female doesn't. So as I mentioned, their distribution is typically found around northeastern Africa. They're found in Somaliland and Somalia and even Ethiopia. Their main range is kind of Somaliland as well. And they're only co confirmed in Jishabat in 1993. Uh, in terms of the habitat, these guys typically like to live in rocky or stony hilllands and slopes along dry grasslands with acacia shrub and things like that. And in terms of the habits, they've only been recorded giving birth uh, in April in the height of the raining season. Typically, the gestation lasts about six months and one calf is born. They are mostly active in the early morning and late afternoon and rest in the middle of the day. And they have excellent hearing and quite wary, so they're always on the lookout for predators. And they move up to great speed up the slopes and rocky slopes to get away from predators. They're quite well adapted for these arid environments as they do not actually drink water. They obtain all their food that they, the water that they need from their food. And they live in small family groups or pairs, always with a single male, but larger groups have been recorded. Uh, and uh, occasionally groups will meet up and things like that. Uh, in terms of uh, diets, these guys are primarily browsers, so they typically feed on branches and leaves and things like that. But they will graze when grass is available. And they are the main main predators of these guys include hyenas, jackals, and uh, caracals. But they've also been known to be eaten by lions and leopards. So they are considered vulnerable. So they have some low-level hunting, but of it, because of its small size, extreme wariness, and inaccessible habitat, they are kind of not really too worried about hunting of these guys. They're not really that impressive. Uh, though big issues such as cutting of acacia shrubs, overgrazing, and drought. Uh, for charcoal production as well. So droughts and cutting of acacia shrub for charcoal has proved to be great threats to their population, which is why they're listed and vulnerable. And just about, they're actually considered uh, rare, but not endangered. And in Ethiopia, you don't really know. They were last recorded in 1972 in Ethiopia. But they have been breeding in captivity. There is the Ashwaraba um, Wild Preservation that has bred uh, these the species. And their numbers actually peaked at 58 in 2008. So they've done a great job actually reading these animals so that's really really cool so let's look at you let's see if we can look at the males so let's have a quick look at the male before we go really really nice mod so mark always does great job with his antelope and other ungulates really really awesome and nice to get a good look and it's nice for leaf and gen to help out with that so yeah really really awesome mod definitely love that one next up we've got another narwhaler mod how can you not love a narwhaler mod we have got here the key deer so it's the key deer Look at this cute guy. So the Kia deer, these are a subspecies of the white-tailed deer. So Oxychlorus virginianus clavum. Did you see that? They're endemic to the Florida Keys. So it's just a really small chain of islands around the southern tip of Florida, which is quite interesting. And they're the smallest extent a North America D species. I think there is potentially an argument to call them a different species. Um, they're quite characteristic because they're smaller than any other white-tailed deer. Adult males get about... Uh, 25 to 34 kilograms or 55 to 75 pounds and stand about 56 centimeters or about 30 inches tall at the shoulder uh, which is quite interesting it does a little bit smaller about 20 to 29 kilograms or 44 to 64 pounds and get an average height of 26 inches or 40 66 centimeters at the shoulders as well but you can see they're quite reddish brown that interesting color there and um uh, gray brown in color and antlers are typically grown by males very similar to other deer between february and march and they regrow them in june when antlers are growing they have this white velvet color and they're, they're pretty much uh, otherwise they look very similar to other subspecies of white tailed deer other than kind of their size and things like that so in terms of their distribution things like that uh behavior these guys can easily swim between different islands and they live quite close to humans they have island tamers so they're not really too worried about predators so they'll even be found in people's yards and things like that and often they will sadly die like other deer subspecies of uh, white-tailed deer subspecies of road collisions and things like that which is very very sad typically these guys will breathe throughout the year let's have like the cute little babies while we talk about their breeding they'll typically breathe throughout the year so um 
but they peak in October through December, and territory access is limited to a, uh, defending a receptive doe from other bucks. Typically, males will live for about nine years and females about seven years, so that's the longevity records. And adult females will form loose matriarchal groups of one to two generations of offspring, or bucks feed and bed together outside the breeding season. So as I mentioned, these guys live in a small chain of islands called the Florida Keys. So um, all the lower Florida Keys, where there's like standing water pools, but they're now really limited to a stretch of the keys from the Sugarloaf Key to the Barahonda Key, and they use all these islands during the wet season when drinking water is the most available. Then they retreat to islands with more permanent water sources in the dry months. And um, they are typically, about most of the vigils live on the big Prince Key Island uh, at the moment that they used to live around them. And they typically inhabit all sorts of habitats, including uh, mangroves, freshwater wetlands, rocklands, and things like that. And they've been observed feeding on 150 species of plants, but they're like mangroves, uh, silver palms, and uh, Palm berries, such palm berries, and things like that, very important for their diet. The habitat as well, the pine rock heart habitat is quite important because it's the only reliable source of drinking water for these guys. And a big issue for these guys is habitat destruction, uh, as I mentioned, collisions. And because people like planting ornamental plants, uh, it actually increases the likelihood of conflict. So they like to go and poach, poach people's gardens, and people don't like them because of that. So uh, there are subspecies of, uh, as I mentioned, the white tail deer. So how they evolved is they likely, because of the ice age when the sea levels were down, deer could pretty much just walk to the keys pretty easily. So once the ice uh, age ended, uh, the the sea receded, the, you know, the, they went down. These guys were pretty much isolated on those islands. Happens to so many other species, but this was so recent, only within the last like 15,000 years they became this small. Which is quite interesting and they're considered endangered so uh, they were hunted by native tribes and then hunting was banned in 1939 but widespread poaching and habitat destruction has caused their population to plummet so recent population estimates put them at about 700 to 800 animals which puts them as an endangered species and um big things for killing these guys is of course uh road uh road to kills and things like that getting hit by cars and they average about 150 to 125 kills per year which is a big issue uh, another thing is habitat fragmentation destruction of habitat due to like urbanization and things like that so that's really hurt their populations quite a bit let's look at the uh, male with his wonderful antlers that's big of an issue also fences has like been a big issue because they can't really get around fences like most air can because they're such quite a bit smaller but um, in terms of their population, they've been actually encouraging, like, populations have been doing quite well. So in 1955, there's been estimated that their populations were as low as 25, but that's stabilized. So they were considered kind of really endangered, but now they're considered, uh, but because they have recovered as well. But there have been other issues such as uh, screwworm infestation in 2016 has kind of affected these guys. And they had to euthanize a few of these animals. And a screwworm is a fly larva that enters the open womb of a live animal, eats the flesh, and it actually leads to quite a gruesome death. So that's why they pretty much put them down when they got it, because it's like a big welfare thing, so it kind of sucks. And... Um, it's quite bad for them. There was an outbreak in April 2017 as well that killed about 135 deer, or about an eighth of the herd. But there's luckily good conservation efforts. There's efforts to try and uh, build reserves to protect these guys. Uh, also trying to build paths so the deer can safely get across uh, the highways and things like that without getting run over. And some trying to encourage people not to feed them and getting them used to vehicles and people and things like that. Uh, which makes them more likely to get hit and killed by vehicles so making sure they still stay scared and other things to try and protect them so there's lots of uh, efforts to try and protect these wonderful animals because uh, I think it's a really cool these cute little deer because I know everyone loves their white tail deer but why not a little pocket one that's very cute and they're sadly very endangered because people of course and I hope we can uh, keep them for the future uh, and they're always probably going to require some sort of conservation effort because they live in such a small area and so reliant on uh, those things like that. They're always going to require some sort of population uh, management. But yeah, really, really cool animals. Definitely love these guys. So next up, we've got... Uh, that was Narwhaler. Next up, we've got the Olsen's Palm Civet. Uh, or Olsen's, if you say that. So really, really cool guy here. This is done by Good Boy and Genora Pizza. Uh, good boy always this wonderful mods and we've got two good boy mods today which i'm really excited to talk about so yeah this is the olsen's palm civet or chlorogate olsoni these are a civet native to vietnam laos in southern china 
They are typically considered endangered because they have a quite a declining population, but we'll get to that. So the Olsen's palm civet is a mid-sized palm civet. They typically get about 57 centimeters uh, or 23 inches long, plus a tail that's about 17 inches or about 43 centimeters. They have a quite a pointed face, as you can see there. They're often uh, compared to like shrews, uh, which is quite interesting. They also have like this tawny black marking on their face as well, and they've got these really interesting stripes along as well, these bands on their back as well. And they also somewhat look like a banded palm civet, except for the hair on their neck is not reversed. And they also have spots on their legs. So it's kind of the way you can tell them apart from other very closely related parts of civets. And you can see these quite dark markings going along their gray body. So it really gives a lot of contrast to them. Uh, in terms of their distribution and habitat, these guys live in forests and wooded areas uh, around in river basins of Vietnam, northern Vietnam, northern Laos, and southern China. And there are species that we actually don't know that much about. So very little is known about the history, though there has been limited kind of information from captive animals. They feed mostly on earthworms and other invertebrates, uh, typically. So that's, you can see why they kind of look like a shrew. And the mating season is apparently from late January to uh, in late January. And after gestation of about three months, typically one to three cute little baby civets are born. And they are quite cute. And in terms of captivity, they have been bred in captivity and tries to coordinate with different zoos to breed them. But yeah, there's not too much known about these guys. Quite a restricted range, and that's why they're endangered. But yeah, a really, really cool animal to talk about. And a nice addition to Planet Zoo. Really, really cool. How can you not love these guys? Definitely adorable. And look how he runs. Look at him run. Look at him go. How adorable is that? Cute little babies. I love these civets. I love talking about civets. They're such interesting animals. I do really do like them. So... Next up, we've got last but certainly not least, we have got kind of a remake, but this is, this is an animal we've covered before. It's uh, had a different mod, but uh, Gaboy and Genora Pizza kind of teamed up to make a really, really awesome uh, version of this animal. So it's kind of going to be the definitive one, I think, from now on. So we've got here the uh, Bobcat. So again, done by Genora uh, Gaboy and Genora Pizza. I can't really speak today. But anyway, these are the Bobcat, also known as the Red Lynx. So these are a medium-sized cat that comes from North America. They range from southern Canada all the way down through the United States into Mexico. And I consider least concern because they are quite a uh, wide distribution, quite a big population. Though there is some populations that have declined and uh, things like that. We'll get into that. So... Uh, very interesting evolution. So these guys would have come from, uh, so these are genus Lex, since uh, she's acclaimed with Puma and Felis, things like that. The Bobcat is thought to evolve from the Eurasian lynx as they crossed across the Bering Land Bridge into America during the Pleistocene, so about 2.6 million years ago. And then it first appeared during about 1.8 million years ago, so they would have evolved during like the early Pleistocene. And then uh, another thing come down, so typically the lynx... Uh, the first bobcat moved there and soon got up by glaciers, and then their population evolved into the bottom bobcat about 20,000 years ago. The second population also arrived and then evolved into the bottom Can uh, Canada lynx, and there has been hybridation between Canada lynxes and bobcats that does seem to be quite minimal. And there used to be all sorts of different subspecies of bobcats, but now that's considered kind of no. There's two subspecies. There's one that lives east of the Great Plains and one that lives uh, west of the Great Plains. It's kind of the best way to tell them apart. So they don't look too different from other species of lynx, though they are the smallest out of the four species. They have quite a variable coat that gets from tan to grayish brown, but they have black streaks and body and things like that. There's quite a bit of uh, variation between them. And they have that spot spotted pattern that helps the, with camouflage as well. You can see there's like some variations, like desert populations tend to be a little bit brighter, and some northern populations tend to be quite a bit darker. Variation depending on where you live. But yeah, you can see that really interesting tuft going on there, especially on the ears as well. Uh, kittens are actually born uh, f well furred and already have their spots, which is quite cute. And there's actually been a few black or melanistic bobcats been found around the world, uh, around America, which is quite interesting. In terms of its face, it has uh, extended hair down the side there, like a big ruff, very similar to other bob uh, species of lynx. And the nose, you can see, is per uh, pinkish red. It's very similar to most others. And then they also have pupils that are wider due to nocturnal activity, due to, to kind of help with uh, getting sunlight. Therefore, they have sharp hearing and great vision, and also have great uh, 
climbers, but they also will swim when they need to, but they generally will avoid swimming, like a lot of cats. Typically, an adult bobcat will get about 47.5 uh, 47 to 125 centimeters, or about 18 to 42 in 49 inches from head to tail, and get a quite dubby, stubby tail. Uh, but uh, typically, they'll get about average about 82 centimeters, about 32 inches, like on average. Uh, they have a short tail about 9 to 20 centimeters, or about 3 to 7.9 inch, uh, inches. An adult uh, stands typically around 30 to 60 centimeters, or about 12 to 24 inches tall. Adult males can get quite a bit bigger, so adult males can get a range from about 6 to 18 kilograms, or about 40 to 40 pounds. Average is about 9 kilograms, with females getting between 4 and 15 pounds, or 8 to 33 pounds, with an average of 6.8 kilograms, or or about 15 pounds, with the largest one being recorded about 22 kilograms or 49 pounds, and some unverified reports of some getting bigger than like 27 kilograms or 60 pounds, but uh, you know how it is. But yeah, distribution of habitat, these guys are very adaptable species. Pretty much everywhere you can find them, they live in woodlands, uh, forests, they also be found in deserts and rugged mountain areas, they found in Florida, the swamps, uh, pretty much everywhere. They've also been found in like agriculture areas, and even in cities, uh, they tend to be doing quite well. And that's mainly just because of the prey, so as long as enough prey for them, and enough places to hide, enough water, they will do fine. And they actually do not seem to be limited by humans, as I said, they will uh, only be limited by habitat, so they do live in areas with people, so urban areas and things like that. And uh, they'll be chased by dogs, things like that, that's not a big issue for them. But typically they do well in pretty much every habitat. Historical range, they used to live from southern Canada right down into the Mexican state of Ocasio, so quite a distance. And they're thought to have lost some areas because of hunting, things like that, but typically they're doing quite well in that regard, and they're moving around different areas they could be reintroduced to different areas as well but yeah the bobcat population in canada though is quite limited because of snow depth and the canada lynx so they believe they outcompete the canada lynx kind of outcompetes the bobcat in those areas but pretty much mostly down to the uh south of canada they're doing quite well and it's not entirely d advantage though but they uh, have been found in places like nova scotia things like that and they've been found in scrubland and pine forest and oak forests and they actually range eds at the tropical portion so they do live in at the southern or southern part of their range in like tropical rainforests and things like that so that's quite interesting so these guys are crepuscular so they're typically active mostly during twilight and they keep on the move for about three hours before sunset and up to about midnight and uh, they typically then could come up with dawn for another three hours. They will move about three to 11 kilometers along a habitual route. And the behavior will vary a lot seasonally, but they become more diurnal during fall and winter and then more active at night during the cooler weather as well. So they tend to like cooler weather. They tend to be out a lot more during the day. Warmer weather, they tend to stay out, stay in, uh, hidden. So these guys have well-defined territories and will mark their territories using feces and urine and things like that and chlorine. So typically maintain uh, those kind of areas. They will often have dens and hollow logs and things like that within their range as well. And um, a home range typically depends a lot on where you live. It can range a lot from basically like half a kilometer to like 326 square kilometers, depending on where you live, the like availability of your prey, things like that. Really depends a lot. And it's also seasonal variation. So during the winter, they'll... Uh, move a lot more to kind of uh, move, find more food of course which is quite interesting and um, like most felids these guys are largely solitary as well uh, so they're typically found by themselves only mothers and babies and maybe one trino gets lucky you know but there's a lot of variation within that in terms of hunting and diets these guys can be ab able to go a long period without food but these guys have a preference for mammals so in the united states they'll eat a lot of like hares and cottontails and lots of ra uh, little rabbits and things but they're opportunistic, so they'll feed on every, pretty much everything. They've been known to feed on young ungulates and other carnivores like uh, minxes, uh, uh, skunks, raccoons, domestic cats, squirrels, birds, small sharks, insects, uh, livestock and poultry. They've been known to hunt things like that, but they'll often be hunted, hunt things like pigs and sheep and things like that. And they've been known to scavenge them as well. They've also been known to hunt deer and stuff. And sometimes hunt elk. So they'll hunt young elk as well. So they'll hunt young fawns. So it's very, very interesting in that regard. So they're pretty much on that seafood diet. They seafood, they eat it. So mostly like small mammals, but they'll feed on just about anything. And they typically will hunt. So they'll typically get the deer, then they rush it, and then they bite the throat. And that's how they typically hunt deer. And they seem to have an ecological niche that's uh, kind of uh, very different. They have a mid-sized predator. They don't. Uh, compete a lot with like red foxes or coyotes uh, which is quite interesting so they have been found that populations of bog cats will decrease uh, when there's high population of coyotes things like that but um, 
just depends on what areas and things like that. And they do get uncompeted by the uh, Canadian links. What up with this cute little baby? I love cute little baby. So the average lifespan of a bobcat is about uh, seven years and it really is in 10 years, but they've been known to live up to 30 years in captivity, but the record's 32 years. So they typically breed in their second summer, but females have been known to breed in their first. Uh, typically sperm production will begin around September, October, and the males fertile in the summer. Mates with her, of course, and then they have babies. So typically females in estrus for about 44 days and estrus lasts about four to five days. Uh, and they be, uh, will be reproductive throughout their lives. Uh, a female will raise the young alone. Usually she'll give birth to about one to uh, one to six kits, but usually uh, kittens, but three, two to four, between April and May, after about 60 to 70 days of gestation. Sometimes they will have a seven litter in September, and the female will give birth to them in like an enclosed space, and then they start exploring their surroundings about four weeks of age, and when they open their eyes on like the 10th day. And then they kind of do their thing. Within three to five months, they begin to move with their mother. And then they'll begin to hunt within their first year around the fall. And then they kind of do their own thing afterwards. In terms of predators, these guys, as I mentioned, these guys are mid-sized predators. So they're not much eats them. But there are things that will eat them. Things like cougars and gray wolves will kill adult bobcats. Coyotes will attack adult bobcats and kittens. American alligators have been known to eat them. Uh, fishes as well. But also lots of birds of prey, things like uh, owls and eagles, also foxes and bears have been known to kill them, kittens as well. But also things like parasites, of course, all those kind of things. But yeah, these guys are considered least concerned. They're not threatened with extinction. Their population estimates was believed to be in 1988 between 700,000 and 1.5 million. So it's potentially even greater now, but we don't really know too much about this uh, regard. They're considered endangered in Ohio, Indiana, and New Jersey. But that has been removed because of uh, limited hunting and trapping being allowed. But because of that, uh, some populations have been considered endangered. The Mexican bobcat subspecies were considered endangered until that was lumped. And some populations of the Everglades are actually threatened by the uh, introduced pythons. As a python, reticulated python or a rock python is a pretty good uh, size that, uh, snake to eat. Pretty much these guys, since they'll eat animals much bigger. They're a pretty good meal for a big snake like that. Issues with these guys, also urbanization is uh, broken up habitat, but that doesn't need to bother them too much. They have, can be affected because of roads, things like that, they get run over by roads and obviously decrease the amount of prey, but they seem to adapt okay to that. And um, some urban habitats, they use rodenticides, so that kind of they get poisoned through the poison rats that they're eating. But uh, in general, doing quite well, as I mentioned. Population's probably in the millions, uh, probably about a million or so, which is quite interesting. And there's lots of stories about these guys. Uh, like outwitting rabbits and things like that in terms of their cultures, especially like that. Uh, really, really cool animals like you not love a bobcat. And I think, uh, and I think your boy in Genora Pizza did a really great job covering this guy. So yeah, awesome, awesome, awesome. Nice to see a bobcat back and quite a famous animal, if I do say so myself. So yeah, wonderful job. Everyone did a wonderful job today. So uh, this is going to be the last uh, one before the Oceania pack. So I'm going to cover the Oceania pack. I know there's a couple animals that are really, really awesome that I'm going to leave for next time uh, that have come out on the Nexus, but I'm going to leave them. But yeah, great job to everyone who made these mods. Lots of remakes. Uh, nice to see like Bobcats, things like that. I like seeing the Civet as well. Really, really cool. So um, yeah, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always forget that little bell icon to get notified of learning things. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye-bye.